Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and thanks for joining the webinar, Hacking Identity, the Good, Bad, and Ugly of Identity-Centric Security Controls. My name is Julie Smith, and I'm the Executive Director of the Identity Defined Security Alliance. Before we get started, I want to do a quick introduction to the IDSA for those that may not be familiar with us. The IDSA is a nonprofit organization that facilitates community collaboration to help organizations reduce risk by providing education, best practices, and resources to implement identity-centric security. Our membership is comprised of leading identity and security vendors, in addition to our customer advisory board members, who provide guidance on our mission and represent the practitioner community. We deliver on our mission through cross-vendor collaboration to produce our identity-centric security framework, which is a set of vendor-agnostic best practices, security outcomes, and approaches customer implementation stories so you can learn from your peers, thought leadership through blogs, white papers, research, and webinars like the one we are presenting today. And we'd love to have you join us in our mission. With that, let me introduce our speaker today, Jared Brennan. By day, Jared is a storyteller, teacher, speaker, advisor, security architect, and actor. He works as an identity strategy and solutions advisor for SailPoint. He's also a member of the IDSA technical working group. By night, he's a husband, father, writer, filmmaker, martial artist, musician, and gamer. It's fair to say that he's earned every gray hair in his beard, having spent his career fulfilling infosec roles in consulting, higher education, retail, and public utilities. If you have questions for Jared, please submit them through the Q&A chat window, and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. Jared, I'll turn it over to you for our discussion. Great, thanks, Julie, I really appreciate it. Um, and thanks folks for, for joining the webinar. Um, I, uh, I am one of those information security professionals who ended up in the profession instead of choosing it. Uh, as Julie mentioned, um, I'm active in a lot of things outside of the cybersecurity community. And actually, uh, in my undergrad days a few years ago, uh, I went to school to be a music teacher. Um, I've got a, I'm not singing or, or performing on the webinar, but uh, music is very much a part of my life and my family's life. But um, while this, I love teaching, um, I would have been fired uh, within the first year of teaching in the public schools. Um, I tend to uh, say things that might uh, frustrate or upset people. I tend to be blunt, uh, which doesn't play so well in, uh, in the public school space. Uh, my wife, taught for, uh, gosh, 10, 15 years before becoming a full-time mom. And uh, she's a saint, right? She's got patience above and beyond what I could do. But as I started down a career path of something that was interesting to me where I could build a career and do something I enjoy and take care of my family, that uh, drive toward information security and ultimately penetration testing and ethical hacking was a gimme. Um, so over the years, I've, I've worked in enterprise roles where I've been managing teams and building security programs and building internal red teams. Um, I've also been a consultant where I, I've done a lot of my penetration testing, and I've gone into organizations to help them understand what controls are going to protect their organization from an actual uh, cyber criminal. Um, I'm active in multiple organizations, as Julie said, the IDSA, ISSA, ISC Squared, OWASP, uh, and a fervent supporter of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, one of my favorite, uh, favorite groups out there. Um, and my goal today was to share some insights with you from, uh, from what I've learned over the years. So I want to tell you how I got in uh, and how some of the pen testers I work with, people who are uh, a lot smarter and more clever than I am in this space. Uh, they continue to get in through some fundamental basic weaknesses. And um, the pattern that I began to notice early on is that it all comes back to identity and whether or not we've got this identity stuff figured out. Um, I did also want to point out, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be doing my job as a security professional if I didn't quote Sun Tzu, right? Um, what I'm sharing today is in order to help people understand how to defend themselves. Um, I know this is publicly available information, and uh, I want to emphasize the term ethical and ethical hackers 
some of this stuff could be used to get into people's Facebook accounts and, and you know, the, the things you'll, you'll be asked as soon as you tell somebody that you're a pen tester and ethical hacker. Um, I'm encouraging you to, to use the information responsibly. Always get permission, obviously, before you, uh, you engage. Uh, but d please, you know, do what I do. Use it, use it to teach. Use it to help educate people on how to, uh, to make their organizations more resilient. Now, while I have my own anecdotal experience about this uh, exposure in the identity space, I actually had it uh, reaffirmed a few years ago by F5, who went to, to the market and did a, a research report, and they wanted to identify initial attack vectors. They were looking for ways that attackers got in that ultimately led to a significant uh, security incident or even a, a data breach. And what they found, the overwhelming majority of these breaches all came back to a weakness in application security controls or identity controls or a combination of the two. Um, and I saw this combination firsthand on one of my pen tests. Uh, we, um, we were targeting a small to medium enterprise who engaged us to do external pen to show us how far you can get from the outside. Uh, doing some recon of their external network, we found a PBX admin uh, web page. Um, and for folks who aren't familiar with the acronym, right, depending on how much gray you have, uh, PBX is, uh, is like an old school phone system, right? And um, when I found this web page, right, I did what all incredibly sophisticated hackers do. Uh, I immediately did a web search for the admin guide because I wanted to see if there were default uh, privileges, default credentials for the admin account, which of course there were. It was an older technology that shipped with uh, default creds and uh, to no surprise, uh, the company hadn't changed that default admin password. So without any fancy tricks, I was able to log in with this admin password exploiting weakness in their identity controls and then start attacking the application from the inside as an admin. Um, I found a a utility page that was making calls to the internal system, a box on their internal network. And that utility page was using basic Linux commands like netstat. So I thought, well, what happens if I stand up a web proxy, intercept that, that traffic and change the command? Can I run a different command when I click the button on this form field in this, this web app? Uh, and so um, I tried another staple uh, cat slash Etsy slash password, which uh, for folks who aren't familiar with Linux, cat gives you the ability to display the contents of a text file on screen. And while Etsy password doesn't contain plain text passwords, it does show you a list of all the, the local user accounts on that box. And uh, it worked. Um, the application was able to uh, send that call to the box and then give me the contents of that file on the web page. Uh, and that was all I needed. Right at that point, I was able to execute a series of commands to give me my own account. And then I was on their internal network with uh, higher level privileges on a uh, Linux box that had full network access to everything else on the inside. Um, so while F5 is aggregating the data based on their conversations, I saw it very specifically, and it was one of the more effective penetration tests uh, that we, we executed. Um, at the company. I also uh, was very happy to see the research done uh, in April of 2020 um, through the Identity Defined Security Alliance that they published in the white paper, Identity Security a Work in Progress. Progress. And this was a, a conversation with people who have identity responsibility at organizations of a variety of sizes, a pretty large sample size, 500 professionals, well qualified in, in, her, in terms of who they interviewed and the questions they asked. And what they found, the overwhelming majority of the people they spoke with had a breach that true enough came back to identity weaknesses. And almost 80% of them had had that breach within the past two years. Uh, and when asked the question, could you have prevented this? Almost every one of them said yes. And I, I don't know who that 1% was that said no, but uh, I'm forever the optimist. I, I think that maybe there was a way to prevent it that maybe that person uh, wasn't aware of or, or hadn't considered. Um, and it, the other stat that jumped out to me was uh, organizations that take this proactive approach to identity 
uh, are less impacted by these breaches. When they looked at people who were putting things in place to get ahead of the, the, the identity um, uh, exposures, they were finding that, uh, you know, sure enough, <laughs> the fewer of them were, were impacted. So there was a lot of data here to back up what, you know, we're, we're seeing in the field, which is if you get this identity stuff right, it really shuts down uh, a lot of attackers before they can gain a foothold in your organization. Now, one of the challenges we have as organizations, though, is that our attack surface is ridiculously large. Um, there's a lot of publicly available user information online now, thanks to uh, social media, for one, and thanks to a lot of uh, marketing services, one of which I, I still use for open source intelligence gathering. Um, and if you want to find information about who works at a company, what's their email address, what uh, what usernames are they using to log into things? You can grab all of that data without ever touching the company's network, without touching any systems or applications that they manage. And that overwhelming amount of user information makes it easier for attackers and harder for defenders, as does the amount of publicly available system information. You, folks, the Internet would not work if we weren't broadcasting things like IP addresses and uh, DNS entries and subdomains and uh, the ports that, that our applications are, are listening on, right? That's, that's the fundamental underpinning of how our company to company and com company to customer communication works. And all of that information is equally accessible by an attacker. I'll show you a few tools that, again, you can collect that information about an organization without ever touching any of their stuff. And if I look at the, the rise of all things as a service, not just infrastructure, platform, software, but database as a service, identity as a service, logging as a service, cloud technology lets us move quickly. And if we do it well, it lets us manage our costs a lot better than doing it on-prem. So leaders are saying, go to the cloud, go to the cloud. Well, as we're doing this, all those governance controls that we built around our entire IT environment are starting to, uh, to wear thin. And it's almost like we're starting over with how do we, we rein in controls here. Um, these three factors in particular make it a lot easier for an attacker to find a weakness in, in how you're managing your identity. Uh, and it makes it harder for defenders, obviously, to stay ahead of it. We've also seen a shift in the attacker's mindset. Um, go back to the script kitty days, and I want to deface a website. Ha, ah, it's funny. And we move on, and then you get some more sophisticated criminals and organized crime who actually want to steal data. Well, now it's, it's not a one-and-done exercise. There was a very large uh, hospitality chain who was impacted a few years ago, um, well, recently, disclosed the breach, but found that the attackers were, were camping out on their network for four years. And I know when that news dropped, there were a lot of, of um, cynics in the cybersecurity industry who looked down on that and said, well, how, how could you let somebody sit on your network four years and not know they were there? And I think that those people have never actually managed uh, an information security program. It's, it's challenging to stay on top of everything. And I am yet to meet a security uh, manager, director with infinite staff and infinite budget, right? Enough resources to stay on top of everything. And so even uh, e e though an attacker can get in, maybe you miss that initial attack. If they're clever and they stay under the threshold of your traditional alerts or, or aberration from baseline user behavior, uh, it's, it's actually somewhat simple for an attacker to, uh, to just camp out and exfiltrate data over time. Now, this, uh, this eight-step process, sorry, I should have a, a strike through there where it says 10, uh, because uh, it's, it's getting simpler and simpler. And I would argue, even since I've been actively pen testing, uh, this process has become um, less complex. Uh, we had a repeatable process that we would execute when we went into a penetration testing engagement, and almost without fail. Again, the majority of the, the engagements that we uh, conducted with our customers, we were able to compromise their internal network before lunchtime on the first day of the pen test. And we didn't, uh, we didn't jump right into Metasploit. 
We didn't look for some fancy O-Day. We didn't uh, try to write some Python exploit that uh, nobody else had ever seen before. Because, yeah, that's that's fun. As a pen tester, that's, that's one of the things that keeps us engaged. But ultimately, if we've got a time-constrained engagement, we're looking for path of least resistance. And that path of least resistance was always open source intelligence gathering and a valid set of user credentials. If I could get one set of creds that let me get somewhere, whether it's into a particular application, into an email account, or ideally VPN that is not protected with multi-factor, uh, once I'm in, I'm in. And then uh, it's all privilege escalation and lateral movement. Um, the fact that it's a repeatable process should also be concerning to defenders because attackers aren't haphazard. They're not coming at this randomly. They're being very deliberate and they're using techniques that have been publicly available for years. Uh, I've got a few links here and I should have clarified it at the beginning. Um, I built this slide deck to be a takeaway. So you will have access to the, the slides of PDF because I share a lot of information that I hope teams will take and build into their, uh, their own programs. Um, if I look back at some of these, in particular, uh, the password spraying uh, post that Black Hills InfoSec published in February 2016, um, that's you know my favorite attack technique right there because it works so frequently and the tools and techniques to execute th that attack are continuing to improve. Um, but what we need to be aware of is attackers have access to this same knowledge and same information as well, and they've had it for years. So it's on us to figure out, well, what can we do to, um, to negate those attacks, to uh, get ahead of that initial attack vector and reduce the likelihood that an attacker is going to be successful. Now, in focusing on identity, I don't make assumptions that, that people all understand what I mean. Uh, because we all come from, from different backgrounds. I look at identity within the context of identity governance and administration. And in, in my experience, I, identity governance really covers all the identity things that you're responsible for. It covers identity management, which is proving somebody is who they say they are, right, the authentication piece. Uh, well, and access management, which uh, takes that authentication piece into authorization and says, now that I've let them in, uh, what, what can they get to? Uh, and it also takes privilege into account for the accounts that have more authority, that can do things that not every user can do. But this concept of, of governance says, do the right people have access to the things they need in order to do their jobs? The principle of least privilege, which I know most of us have uh, been hearing and practicing for years, is based on that concept that I just want to give somebody enough access to do what they need to do. And I want to make sure that they've always got that right level of access, not too little, but not too much. And it's obviously much, much easier said than done. Um, I look at identity also through the concept of a, um, a life cycle, an identity life cycle, which is someone's going to have an identity or relationship with the organization where that identity is now uh, brought into the fold. And then you give multiple accounts to the identity that let them access not just on-prem systems and apps, but cloud service and apps. As they move over time, that access is going to change, right? If, if someone has been at an organization for 20 or 30 years and they're in a senior IT role or an IT individual contributor role, you absolutely better believe that that's one of the first accounts I'm going to go after as a pen tester because that account is more likely to have brought all of this extra access with it from the previous roles, uh, because taking access away is challenging. And that's what those mover events are meant to make sure that people are getting new access and ideally losing access to things they don't need anymore. And then when someone leaves an organization, you go back to that identity, look at all of the accounts that the identity has associated with it and start turning them off. Now, this was easy when it was just, let me go into AB and disable the account. And then any app that authenticates against Active Directory is easily uh, contained, right, that we've reduced the, the risk or the exposure. But now that we've got all these software as a service apps that have their own native user stores that might be entirely disconnected from our internal network or from any access management system, 
that lever activity is leaving a lot of orphan accounts out there for attackers to go after. Um, and as you're looking at your identity program within the context of all those things, the IDSA framework has done a killer job of building out a set of security best practices that are the things that you should be doing if you want to make sure you've covered all the bases when it comes to identity. This goes well beyond what you're going to find in PCI or FISMA or ISO or any of the other standards or regulations that are broader cybersecurity regulations. The IDSA's framework is, I, I remember the first time I read through that, it was just eye-opening to say, boy, I wish everybody knew that if they just did these things, at least considered them and made an informed decision about what to turn on and, and what to get to when they have uh, more time or more budget how much of an improvement that would make in, in their environments. And then the security outcomes and approaches, which I'll be touching on later, uh, map this idea of, well, here's the thing you want to do. How do you do it, right? How do you arrive at this state of, of being protected uh, if, if you've never done this stuff before? So it's, it's a, an amazing resource and cannot recommend it enough that you go out and look through the best practices and especially the, the security outcomes. So now let's dive into those attack techniques. The very first thing I'm going to be doing when engaged for a penetration test is open source intelligence gathering. Um, I do a lot of teaching online. I actually have two courses on Pluralsight that are deep dives on open source intelligence gathering based on the, the time I spent as a pen tester. And my, my OSINT gathering activity is usually split between systems and people. I, I want to understand what your technology stack looks like, and I want to understand who's working for and with your organization. It's really all about trust relationships. With systems, um, Shodan and Census is a, a terrific little one-two punch. Shodan, most people know, right, it's been quoted as uh, the most dangerous search engine on the Internet. If you look up an organization, use the org modifier in the search engine field. You can pull back all of the systems that have been associated with or registered with that organization over time, uh, as well as the ports and services that those systems are uh, accessible over. What, what are they broadcasting that you might be able to interact with as an attacker? Um, I, com I combine Shodan's general results with census focus on web activity. Census really looks at uh, HTTP and HTTPS services, which uh, think about it. If you log into anything in order to do your job, are you logging in over HTTPS? Chances are yes, right? Thick clients are, are going the way of the dinosaur, and web everything is the direction we're going. So as an attacker, if I want to know what web interfaces I can attack, Census is going to tell me. And it also gives you some deeper insights into SSL and TLS certificates so that if anyone has wildcard certs or if they've configured certs to reference internal systems, now you have knowledge of systems on the internal network in addition to what Shodan tells you about the outside. Um, find subdomains and DNS dumpster uh, also provide some of the same information, but they uh, provide the, the subdomain details if you give it a top-level domain. So if you look at idsalliance.org, uh, either one of those resources would tell you all the subdomains registered. Uh, what I tend to look for there are, um, give me the non-prod domains, right? I want to know the dev systems you have that are internet facing that you may not have security agents uh, running on. You may not be monitoring because uh, of cost, because you can only keep track of production. Um, I don't need to steal data from a dev system, but I do want a foothold. I do want to compromise a system that's going to give me uh, a jumping point to get to other systems on your internal network. And SPF records is another great one. This one bleeds over into trust relationships. SPF stands for Sender Policy Framework. These are the people who are authorized to send email on your behalf. As an attacker, if you trust somebody enough to allow them to pretend to be you at email, that tells me that there's a relationship I could abuse probably through social engineering. And I've done that in the past where I take information about those trust relationships and build a crafted 
social engineering campaign that makes me look like a representative from someone the, the victim is more likely to trust. So develop an understanding of the systems and then take a look at the people. LinkedIn is one of the best tools to come along for social engineers and hackers in ever. Uh, because if I want to know who works at a company, how long have they worked there, what's their relationship, all of that is readily available. And people who might be looking for a new job or who are extremely proud of something they've worked on over the years are going to post information in their profile about the technologies that they know how to use. So with a, a little LinkedIn query magic, you can start to build a profile of the internal network and the people you want to attack. Hunter is one of those marketing tools that if you say, show me what an email address looks like at this organization, it will give you a number of valid email addresses that you could use for either social engineering or those identity-based attacks against login portals, since so many login portals ask us to log in with an email address. Now, Pastebin is a great place to find people who've already been compromised and don't know it, because if someone posts a, a portion of a password dump out there, uh, you might find some information. I've actually found uh, passwords that were base64 encoded, which if you're not familiar with, with encoding, it's not encryption. So if you find encoded passwords from a breach where someone was insecurely storing password data, you can reverse those back to the plain text credentials, which you then might be able to uh, use against your organization, the one that you're, you're trying to, uh, to defend. Because uh, human nature, people reuse passwords. Now, Intel Techniques is, is another website. They've had to pull some tools offline because people were complaining. But it is my favorite resource for OSINT guidance. Um, they even teach you how to build your own OSINT-specific virtual machine. And then Recon NG and Discover, the other two, these are uh, scripts, but they automate everything I just told you about. So instead of you having to go to each one of these URLs manually and grab this information, you fire up um, Recon G from, uh, NG from Tim Tomes, Discover from mm -hmm. Lee Baird, um, install them both on a Kali Linux box, fire up the Discover script, run it, and it pulls all this OSINT for you in seconds. So super quick, super simple. <clears throat> I also, uh, in addition to that basic OSINT gathering, I'm going to pull down documents that you have publicly available so I can pull the metadata out of those documents. I want to see who created the document. Do you have any references to internal IP addresses like associated with print servers? Uh, I'm, I've been using FOCA for years. I know it's in a weird state of, of maintenance right now. Uh, FOCA is a, a Windows tool if you're more comfortable on Linux boxes. Um, Metagoofle is, uh, is the way to go. Uh, you just have to understand the command line syntax, which I've got an example here. But you pull all those files down from the website, extract the metadata, and you'll be able to collect even more information to round out what you found out about the people in the systems using the, the OSINT gathering. Now, this is considered semi-passive or semi-active OSINT gathering, depending on your preferred language, which means you will be touching their websites or their systems at this point. Uh, the only difference is you're downloading publicly available information that they specifically put out there for people to download. You're not doing anything outside of what a regular end user would do, but instead of downloading one or two documents, the, the difference is you're downloading all of them. And once you have this information in hand, you, you take that understanding of their technology stack, and again, look for admin guides. Admin guides will tell you default credentials if it's an older text, uh, tech, but they'll also give you URLs for uh, admin portals, right? If you find that they're using a particular technology based on the subdomain findings, then the admin guide might tell you what URL and port you should check for if you want to make administrative changes to that same technology. Look for new hire information, um, especially now that people are expected to work remotely. Um, help desks are unfortunately overwhelmed with uh, helping people do their jobs in a way that they never intended them to, to do them. So they may have published a, here's how to log into VPN. Here's your getting started guide for new hires and your default password is X. You can glean a lot of information from those how-to guides 
if you find them in any of the documents that you pull down from the, um, from the organization. Now, the metadata usually provides a user naming convention. So many organizations, when they deploy uh, Office in a Windows shop, will build the person's username into their Office profile. It's absolutely unnecessary in, in most organizations. It, it has no value. The user doesn't even know it's there. But to an attacker, if you've got a random string of letters and numbers that users use for internal authentication, I can find that in the metadata without ever talking to your users. And then once I'm able to get in from the outside, I have an idea of what usernames look like that I can begin targeting internal systems. And also look specifically for login portals. This is where Census really provides some insights. I'm looking for webmail. I'm looking for VPN that's been uh, published over SSL or TLS uh, and password self-service. Oh my gosh, password self-service is one of my favorite favorite things to go after. <coughs> Pardon me. I mentioned password spraying being my favorite attack. I did just want to touch on that. Once you've got all this, this information and you begin targeting and attacking systems, password spraying attacks against any interface that might be susceptible is one of the quickest, easiest ways to get credentials. And if not being monitored or, or detected by the target organization, it's an effective technique for flying under the radar. In a traditional brute force attack, you would have a lot of usernames with a lot of passwords. And that's why we say if you get five or six failures in a row, I'm gonna lock your account because it looks like somebody's doing suspicious. Password spraying flips that on a tier. It says, I'm gonna take all the usernames that I gathered through OSINT gathering, but I'm only gonna try one password at a time. And there's, there's some text missing here on screen, but you'll see it in the PDF. Um, the tool that I, I used to use, NTL Embotherer, is great for attacking external facing Microsoft interfaces. But if you're familiar with Burp, a uh, combination of Intruder and Cluster Bomb, uh, those two modules within the Burp suite, will let you go after any web interface and execute a similar attack where you try to log in again and again, but you only use one password at a time because I've never heard of an organization that locks people out after one failed login. And I have a hunch, if you try to implement a policy to lock users out after one failed login, you're going to be fired. Please don't do that. That's, uh, that's not a good way to make friends throughout the organization. It might be a little too strict from a security policy perspective. Uh, at this time of year, the, the password I would use, fall 2020 exclamation point, or autumn. 2020 exclamation point. Um, why? Those two passwords, uh, uppercase, lowercase, at least eight characters, has a special character, alphanumeric, and oh, if I look outside my window, uh, I have an idea of what season it is. We've put unreasonable password security expectations on non-technical, non-security end users, and they will look for a pattern Right Again, that path of least resistance to say, what's a password I can remember for all these different things I have to log into? Well, something like autumn 2020, if I have to change it every three months, well, the seasons change every three months. And they, I've been on pen tests where we actually used this technique and got three accounts on the first day, uh, two contractors and an employee. And with a contractor account, we were able to get in over single factor VPN and steal uh, HR data that was stored on a company share that that contractor shouldn't have had access to, all because they were using one of these weaker passwords. Um, cascading effect. But uh, the, there are a few options. You, you can tune it down to go through a list of passwords if you wanted to try every one here in the list, uh, but do it over a, a period of time so it doesn't trigger any alerts or alarms. Once an attacker gets in, again, with that one set of creds, Privilege escalation and lateral movement is standard fare. There are a number of tools that have been published over the years. Some have kind of fallen out of popular usage because every endpoint agent worth its salt is going to be looking for these types of attacks now. Um, but I recommend take a look at PowerShell Empire, uh, powershellempire.com, uh, or go out to uh, GitHub and look at PowerShell Mafia. So many organizations rely on Active Directory. Um, that's uh, uh, definitely a feather in Microsoft's cap that they've been able to have 
such a uh, a widespread impact on the industry. Uh, but likewise, when Windows 10 dropped and PowerShell became uh, enabled for everybody, right? It became the norm. Um, attackers found that, well, if I write my own PowerShell scripts, um, I can do things like restart services that are running with privilege, which is what PowerUp does. It takes a look on the box and says, which one of these is running with administrative credentials? Antivirus, maybe? And then it sends a command to restart that AV agent. Only when it starts back up, it says, oh, by the way, while you're starting up, since you're a privileged account, why don't you go ahead and create a local admin account for me? And if it works, it gives that attacker a foothold that they can then use to target other um, other accounts on the system or other systems on the same network. Social engineering will, in my opinion, forever be uh, an effective attack against the identities in your organization. Uh, this tweet was actually published in June of 2016, talking about how attackers were sending these uh, messages out to try to trick people into allowing them to bypass two-factor authentication. Um, the, the technique uh, known as preconditioning, um, if I understand through my open source intelligence gathering what, um, who your trust partners are, then maybe I send an email to a number of people, say, hey, this is so-and-so from that company that you know and love, and we're testing some changes to our environment. Um, as part of these changes, it may trigger a notification on your two-factor system. If you see one of these texts pop up, just click yes to make the message go away. No other action required on your part. And for a non-technical end user who says, oh, I could either leave this up and, and keep getting pinged that I need to say yes to two-factor, or I can click yes to make it go away, that may sound like a reasonable option for them. And it's just one of the multiple social engineering attacks you can launch. We would actually go on site and walk around and look for sticky notes. Um, some of you may recognize this person for those who don't. Uh, at one point, he was a physician for the 45th president of the United States. And this is his actual Facebook profile pic, which is public. You don't need any special access to be able to see it. And I've circled the sticky note on the monitor in this picture. Now, fortunately, the, uh, um, the pixelation of the sticker is enough that I don't know that anyone can see what's on there. But I've been in enough shops to know that, that sticky notes on monitors more often than not include login information. And in this case, now it's not a matter of maybe I can get into an organization and steal some credit card numbers. Now it's maybe I can get to the medical records of one of the most powerful uh, political offices in the world and wreak havoc that could result in loss of life, right? It's it's pretty uh, pretty intense stuff. But if, if you get on site uh, when we're not socially isolating, we would walk around like we were building inspectors and check fire extinguishers and door locks and write down any passwords we saw on whiteboards or sticky notes. Um, calling the help desk, uh, people who are conditioned to be helpful and trick them into to give up, uh, giving up information or resetting passwords is a given. They should be the people that you're focusing on most intently when it comes to your security awareness training efforts because unfortunately, uh, they're very high profile targets. And then uh, password reset emails. Um, Social engineer toolkit from Dave Kennedy. Uh, it's a great little tool. It's still out there on GitHub that you can play around with it. Has a site cloning option that you point to any website, right, Gmail, and say, create a fake version of this website. And once you've got the fake version of the website, you can have it up and running on your own domain and then send a password reset notification to end users to say, hey, your, uh, your password was reset or in order to unlock your account, right? It looks like somebody was trying to break into it. Go to our company page and uh, just enter your credentials and you'll be good to go. It looks and feels like the legit site, and it doesn't take any special knowledge to get one of these fake sites up and running. It's all automated through that tool. So again, social engineering is, is very much a big deal. And when it comes to compromising identities of people working for or with your organization, um, it's, it's going to remain one of the, the top attack techniques. 
I had another pen test where I got in by exploiting a password self-service portal. Uh, we did a pen test for somebody one year. I found this portal and figured out that if I keep uh, refreshing the page, I can get a laundry list of their secret questions. Well, all I had to do at that point was go out to Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and do recon on particular people to try to figure out what the answers were for their secret questions. And the first year I did it, um, I wasn't able to get in. Fortunately, they gave you a couple of tries and then locked you out of the tool without locking you out of the domain, which was a really smart practice. But I told them, you're still exposed. If you engage us next year, uh, I'm going to start with this on day one. They said, Jared, that's great advice. We appreciate it. Um, we'll take it under advisement. Uh, they engaged us next year. I went out to their password self-service portal, and it was exactly as it was the year before. So I was more cautious. Um, I found an IT director where one of the secret questions was, what year did you graduate from high school? Well, I can use a website like familytreenow.com to find that out about anybody, which highly recommend you look yourself up on that website to see how much information is publicly available about you and your family members and encourage people to not use any of that information in secret questions. Uh, but I, I had the year the, the director graduated. The other question that I went after was, what was your favorite toy as a child? Which is a tough one. I, I, I don't know that I can answer that. I had a Stretch Armstrong that I really dug that was uh, kind of nasty once you stretched him too far and he got holes and that purple goo started leaking out. But until then, it was a great toy. But, you know, how am I going to know somebody else's favorite toy as a kid? Again, a little open source intelligence gathering, this time on the director themselves and not the company. And I found that the director had their own website uh, all about Lego uh, toys, right? Very much a Lego enthusiast. Every favorite icon was a little minifig head. So I went back to the password reset portal. What's your favorite toy? L-E-G-O-S. Enter. What do you want your new password to be? And I was able at that point to pillage data from the director's inbox uh, from a single factor VPN, although they did restrict the number of apps I could get to. They did have some controls on the inside that limited the damage I could do. Um, but I was able to steal a lot of data in 10 minutes. And then I had a very uncomfortable call with the, uh, the person who hired us to let them know that, yes, uh, I was able to compromise this account. And chances are you're, you're going to have someone uh, who's upset that I've changed their password, so you might want to give them a call. Um, uncomfortable, though, it, it was an important uh, conversation to have because as we move more and more towards self-service and as we enable self-service in all these SaaS apps, we're expecting users to be responsible in choosing answers to secret questions that they haven't already published on Facebook and all those silly quizzes, right? What's your uh, royal wedding name, right? What's, what's your, um, what was the one? What's your stripper name? That's, uh, and if you don't know that one, there's, there's a formula there uh, for people. Uh, it's the street that you grew up on as a child and the, uh, the name of your first pet, which are, again, two common answers to secret questions. In addition to password reset portals, um, any application that would allow me to self-register, especially as an end user, not a, um, I should say a customer, not an employee, but someone on the outside, I would always register and see if I could attack the app from the inside, right? The killer is inside the house. Um, I had a, a pen test where uh, the organization was using Drupal. They had a really sharp security team on the AppSec side. Uh, but they had one gap in this custom component that if I jumped out of the UI, if I jumped out of the, the browser and started watching traffic between my machine and the server using, again, a, a proxy, a local proxy, um, I was able to jump to other uh, pages if, uh, that belong to other profiles. Um, and it all had to do with the database identifier for my ID. So my ID was one, two, three, four, five. Um, I go to edit my profile and I intercept that and say, I want to edit one, two, three, four, four instead. And it gave me somebody else's profile. And so what I did is, is I actually went all the way back to zero because in Drupal, zero is the database identifier for the super admin account or whatever they call it, the most powerful account in the system. 
and the tool said, Jared, you're stupid. I'm not going to let you change the password for the super admin account in this web app. So I just started incrementing one, two, neither of those users exist. But when I hit three, then I had an active user account. I looked that user up on LinkedIn and it was a senior level application administrator who'd been at the company for decades. What level of privilege do you think he had associated with his account? I didn't need the super admin account because I was able to exploit an application security weakness that then gave me the ability to compromise an application administrator's account, which uh, gets into privilege um, ultimately. But And then the, the last tool I, I wanted to share that um, I recommend you use cautiously is Responder. Responder takes advantage of the chattiness of um, uh, Ethernet. Uh, if, you, if you're on a, a network in your office, you're – Every machine on the network is constantly shouting to other machines, hey, I'm looking for this machine. Is that you? Is that you? Is that you? Uh, with Responder, you can tell your machine to start saying yes to everybody. That whenever a machine says, hey, I want to log in, I'm looking for the machine I should log into. Is that you? Your laptop will say, yeah, I'm, I'm that server. Come over here. Um, you can use this to collect credentials once you're on an internal network, but you can also – bring an entire subnet down as all of that traffic is going to be routed through your, your network car. So please be careful, but highly recommend that you, you try this in a very cautious fashion on your internal network. Because again, once an attacker is on an internal system, they're looking for additional sets of credentials. They're looking for additional identities that they can use to target your organization. And with all of those techniques, whether it's a password spraying attack, social engineering, whether I'm using a tool like Responder, whether I'm resetting passwords, folks, every one of those attacks is going after someone's identity. I want to pretend to be somebody who's supposed to be there. And I just need one. If I can just get one set of credentials, even one that belongs to a contractor, I could do as much damage as we saw with the Office of Personnel Management breach, where a contractor had access to a production database that had more data than that contractor needed access to in order to do their job. So now I want to flip the, the script a bit. I want to talk about defensive techniques because it's surprisingly simple to shut down these attacks. Number one, you should be doing that OSINT gathering against your own attack surface. There's nothing stopping you. You do not need permission to collect publicly available information about your company. It's in the name publicly available that negates the whole rules of engagement thing. You do need to be cautious when you get into semi-passive, or I'm sorry, semi-active or full-on active intelligence gathering. Don't run scans unless people know you're running scans and are okay with it. But because you work for the company, you have a process to say, hey, I want to run an NMAP scan of our network. I want to run vulnerability scans and see what we look like from the outside. I want to run authenticated vulnerability scans from the inside. Look for some of those weaknesses that an attacker might exploit once they get on the network, right? That power up. If I've got uh, an AV agent that I can bounce and, and create my own set of local credentials, well, maybe your vulnerability scanner can tell you which agents you have that are vulnerable to that type of attack so that you can mitigate that risk on, on systems where that agent is installed. You've got tools and, and resources and access. Leverage it because OSINT tends to be outdated and somewhat inaccurate uh, from an attacker's perspective. But you can combine the OSINT and the active intelligence gathering to really figure out where you're exposed and focus your efforts. Then once you've got that data in hand, just start shutting stuff off, right? Consolidate or eliminate internet-facing systems, close network ports, remove or sanitize that metadata uh, these, these are all simple, no cost. Actually, some of these will be cost savings activities. So you can get someone on your leadership team to say, yeah, that's going to save money. Do it. And it, it just tightens up your, your security posture. And then disabling act, inactive accounts, understanding the, the relationship between an identity and all the accounts that identity has, especially in SaaS services, start turning stuff off whether you're doing it automatically or whether you're doing it through some kind of certification campaign where you're asking people to check and make sure everything's current. Um, remove privilege, remove access. If people don't need access, you don't need 
80 domain administrators. You might think you do, but I'd argue that there's a more efficient way to do Windows directory administration that reduces the risk of so many people having unnecessary privilege. Make sure you're turning on two-factor wherever you can. Uh, I, I swear by it, folks. Some of the stuff we're seeing from FIDO and um, mobile device-based uh, MFA is just going to make it easier and easier, but give us that multi-factor all from a, a smartphone. Um, so look for opportunities to implement multi-factor because while a social engineer might be able to compromise it, all the automated tools, right, the password spraying attack, it's not going to get around in a uh, website protected with MFA. And then talk to people. Train people on using corporate email on personal sites. Um, a number of people were unfortunately embarrassed when the Ashley Madison hack was published. But embarrassment aside, there were a lot of uh, email address password combinations that attackers were able to pull from that data dump that they could then use to go after companies where they found domains in these personal websites. So help people understand the importance of that, the importance of oversharing on social media and detecting and responding social engineering attacks, some basic stuff. And with the IDSA security outcomes and approaches, they have 16 distinct security outcomes defined. And they give you clear guidance on how to achieve these security outcomes. The ones that jump out to me related to the, the conversation around pen testing are discovering rights and limiting who has access uh, to only the things they need in order to do their job. At testing who has access to sensitive data, revoking access when you detect activity that might be considered high risk or might be a, a deviation from what that user is supposed to do. Right? I've only included a subset here, but uh, if, if you were to just focus on the 16 security outcomes, and then ask me to come in and pen test your organization, I would be incredibly frustrated because you would be shutting me down again and again and again before I even got a foothold in any one system. And the fact that the IDSA has contained that to such a short list is, um, again, it's very impressive uh, from that attacker perspective. They've also got a series of best practices, and I've got these here for reference later on, that divided into, they're divided into groups like what should you do around uh, protecting your identity at the directory level. What should you do from a life cycle, that join, remove, or lever uh, identity governance life cycle to make sure you're minimizing exposure? Um, they've also got a section on governance, a section on privilege, and a general catch-all section for stuff that doesn't fit cleanly into one of the other four categories. But it's a short list, folks. Um, and I found that looking at their best practices through the eyes of the capability maturity model will really help you put some, uh, some guardrails around what you're trying to do with your identity program. It helps you focus and prioritize your efforts so that you know how to achieve those security outcomes even more quickly. Um, the other thing I strongly recommend is look at the relationship between your identity program and your security information and event management system. Um, you're collecting log data. That log data contains all this information about what people should and shouldn't be doing. Um, one of the things I found, Lenny Zeltzer, a uh, security researcher, has his website, zeltzer.com, years ago published a security incident log review checklist that was designed for responders to come in and say, okay, I'm, I'm looking into this incident. What logs should I collect? I've worked on incidents where I went to collect these logs and the people said, yeah, we're, we're not logging that. And that's not just frustrating. In one instance, it was a HIPAA violation that uh, was related to the incident and failure to prove that there was no data exfiltration would have been a business ending event for this company. And they just didn't have logs because they, they hadn't turned these on because the people running the log system didn't know that somebody might ultimately come knocking saying, can you show me these logs? And so if you take the information here that Lenny's published on web servers, network devices, Linux, and Windows systems, you've got a finite list of logging events that you should make sure you have enabled so that you can use them downstream to detect when someone's trying to circumvent your identity controls. Or better yet, put automated response or other preventative controls in place 
that will shut down attacks when they detect that type of activity. Uh, and the last bit of advice I'd offer, embrace misdirection. Honey everything. Honey pots, honey databases, honey tokens, honey creds. There is such a wide variety of free publicly available resources to help you put fake things in your environment that will entice an attacker. So that if you get someone who's able to circumvent your controls and get to the internal network, once they try to abuse the access associated with that account or with that, the, the accounts tied to that identity, you can detect right away that they're doing something they shouldn't because nobody should be touching these honey tokens. Nobody should be logging in with these uh, honey accounts. But if your logging system is saying, tell me when somebody's doing this and shut them down right away, you can prevent that four years of someone camping out on your network and catch them shortly after they get inside because they're going to be looking for things that your honey tokens are broadcasting. So my, my closing thoughts here at the, the end of the discussion is fundamentals are going to win the day, folks. There's a lot of super fancy, super sexy technology out there. I know the company I work for, I give a talk to people who are making it. So I, I get that insider's view on it. Uh, but if you don't have the fundamentals addressed, if, if you're not giving them the attention they deserve, then there's no fancy technology that's going to save you. And that's why looking at the security outcomes, looking at the best practices, from an identity standpoint, those are the fundamentals. And you'll figure out how can we prevent this stuff? How can we detect it? How can we appropriately respond to it in a way that's going to minimize impact, to minimize uh, the, the impact of a security incident? It's all in those fundamentals. And as I mentioned, the, the slides are, are available. I've got some resources here to other courses I have online, including my Pluralsight courses on open source intelligence gathering. I've got a YouTube channel for any talk that I do publicly where a video has been published. So I've got that here. Um, the IDSA security outcomes, both at the securityoutcomes.ids alliance website and here on Bright Talk, uh, there are a number of, of webinars already recorded that you could tap into and get more detail about that information as soon as you're ready for it. And a couple of, of reports, including the work in progress, decade of data breaches, and a Forrester report on the future of identity. Um, a lot of information there, folks, for you to tap into. Uh, but Julie, with that, I wanted to wrap up. I'm going to leave my contact info up, but I wanted to, uh, to see if there were any questions from the, uh, the attendees. Okay, Jared, thanks so much. That was an incredibly insightful information. I think the, to me, sort of the walking away story is that there's no doubt credentials are going to get, are going to be stolen. It's just a fact. Uh, and the whole goal from an InfoSec perspective is how do you limit the damage. Um, yeah. So I think probably we really just have time for one question, uh, maybe two. Um, at least for me, I would imagine top of mind uh, and for others as well is which one security outcome, so you mentioned the IDSA is published 16, um, but which one of the currently published will extend, uh, continue to expand will have the biggest impact on stopping attackers? I love that. That's, uh, gosh, that's a tough one. If for me, and I, I hate the term, but I'm going to use it anyway, it's, it's right-sizing access. If, if I look at um, penetration tests where we were able to do the most harm, I was able to get in with an account and get to something the account should never have had access to. And I think, Julie, if we were to go back to the people who responded to your um, work in progress research, the people who said these, these incidents were preventable, that that would also be a common theme. Um, so for me, that one jumps out is – you, you have to make sure people have enough access to do their jobs so they're not trying to circumvent security. But at the same time, if people have been over-entitled or over-privileged, you're carrying an unnecessary risk that you, you don't need to carry. Although, frankly, I also think if, if an organization were to do an identity program maturity assessment where they use the IDSA best practices in conjunction with the, uh, the capability maturity model from uh, Carnegie Mellon Software Engineering Institute, Right, combine those two resources and get a better understanding of which identity controls are most important to your organization. There's a question underneath that of risk appetite. What, what are leaders 
willing to accept in terms of business risk that's going to impact which security outcomes you want to focus on first. Because from a pure play security standpoint, we've got opinions, but from a leadership perspective, they, they may have other opinions and ultimately we're here to enable the business to be successful. So um, I, I, I'm kind of split on that, but, but I like that question. I like that. Good, thanks. So I think we maybe have a couple of minutes left. I know we're at the top of the hour. There was a question that came in. Um, do you think session management exploitation is a big attack vector or will, be, will it become as big as login security improves? I, I think yes, it is. Um, and I can't comment publicly yet because I haven't submitted the bug bounty, but um, I have a bug bounty that I was able to uh, successfully exploit a session management flaw for uh, an organization that I think most people on the webinar would have heard of. Um, and until I can recreate it, I think there's some other uh, infrastructure uh, controls they have in place that are tripping me up as I, I try to document the bug bounty report. Um, but it, I think it's already an issue when it comes to especially SaaS applications. But in the API space, and we look at, at platform as a service and how API communication is going to become more important, API session management is um, uh, it, it's wide open for attackers right now. There, there's a lot of opportunity for cyber criminals there that we're trying to get ahead of its defenders. So that's another solid question. I, I think it's going to remain an issue, especially on the API side. I think we'll get better as login security improves, um, but but I think the API side is, is to me, the bigger risk. Great. Thanks, Jared. Um, I think we probably ought to wrap it up right now. Um, just want to say I, how much I appreciate your time today and, more importantly, your ongoing support and contribution to the IDSA. Uh, there is a question about uh, slide availability, and, and I will get them published to this Bright Talk um, entry Excellent. on our Bright Talk channel after this session. So I don't know if you're going to mention that. Um, there are yeah, also Julia. links to some of the additional resources uh, as well. You might want to take a take a look at. Go ahead, Jared. Yeah, I, I was going to say I'd, I'd also encourage anybody who's interested connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm very invested in helping to teach and educate in the, the cybersecurity space. And I know somebody might have a question six months from now that they want to ask. Um, if you send that question my way on LinkedIn, I'll see it, and I'll be able to get back to you quickly. So please stay in touch. If I can help you out along the, the way, um, I want to do just that. And, Julie, thanks so much for your chance to do this today. I, I had a blast. I hope people uh, found it helpful. Yeah, I, I think they did. Certainly people hung out for the entire hour, so that's always a good indicator. Um, and Excellent. I want to thank everyone uh, for joining us today. And as I mentioned, make sure to check out our additional resources um, in the attachment section. Uh, we hope that you will join us in our mission of bringing identity and security closer together. So thanks everyone and have a great holiday weekend for those here in the U.S. Thanks. Thanks all. Bye.